Community Church of the Coachella Valley. Well, oh. A good resounding welcome on this chilly morning. It's nice to see that you've turned out in order to be fired with warmth of the Holy Spirit. It's that and three layers of wool that are keeping me warm in there. <laughs> now I have a couple of announcements and Noah has them, so I'm going to have to creep over here and pinch them <laughs> Our first announcement is that Advent Vespers is running um, on Wednesday, December the 11th at 6.30. Uh, for those of you that have been, that is a wonderful service of contemplation and prayer and peace. You know, there is very little peace. Very little peace in this world and peace in our lives. Uh, we lead busy lives, especially in the lead up towards Christmas. And during the week, this gives us a chance to punctuate that week with our worship of God in a place of contemplation and peace. Uh, Christmas Eve service with benediction um, and incense. But you'll be pleased to know it is going to be so high church, people will be gasping for air because of the altitude. We will be putting the mass back in Christmas, amen? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one, you know, I think I should run a campaign this year. MCC of the Coachella Valley putting the mass back in Christmas. Of course, that's what it stands for. <coughs> Christmas Day worship uh, will be 11 a.m. And by the way, the Christmas Eve worship always ends, as usual, with a candlelit um, uh, segment. And then there will be refreshments afterwards, which are all nice Christmas things and warm, spiced, mulled wine and things like that. So if you want your Christmas really made, come along to the Christmas Eve uh, service. Then, the Christmas Day Fellowship pop-up. We need sign-ups, and I'll tell you what else we need sign-ups for. We need sign-ups for the goodies after church, because we have none today. No goodies! Only coffee and drinks. Um, and maybe some cookies if we can find them. So what we need is people to sign up for next Sunday, and for the Sunday after that. And also people to sign up for the Christmas Day potluck. And you know what sort of good things are going to be required for that? Anything you want to eat on Christmas Day, you know? So if you could see Kathy, where is Kathy? Kathy, 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 Kathy. Oh, there you go. If you could see Kathy afterwards, or sign up on the sheet down in unit number one, or see Keith. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, she does now, that's all. <laughs> it's also time, it's his pastor's prerogative, you know, we get to do this. We get to say, oh, Kathy, you're doing that, aren't you? Wonderful. <laughs> it is also uh, an opportunity to say hello to any visitors we have today. Do we have any newcomers to the church today? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, after service, we have refreshments at unit number one at the far end of the building, and you are most very welcome. You are most very welcome. You are most welcome to come along. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, well, refreshment. Coffee is a refreshment? Honestly. <laughs> now is the time to get down to the business that we are here for. The business is to open our hearts and our minds and our souls and our eyes in prayer and worship. And we do that in several different ways. We do that in the sacrament of the Eucharist, in the holy mysteries of the altar. We do that in song. We do that very well in song, I have to say. We do that when the choir sings and when we sing, we do that when we pray. So please, come and join us. Almighty God, last week we were blessed beyond measure. We felt your spirit, and I continue to feel your spirit. I pray that you will hover over this place as you have hovered over creation since its inception. I pray that we all may be blessed by what occurs today. Blessed in song, blessed by the word, blessed by the anointing, blessed by the spirit, blessed by the Eucharist, blessed by prayer. This we pray in Jesus' name.
Our loving, most gracious God, we come to you now as your children in this time of confession. God, we come to you in this time just to tell the truth about ourselves and to experience the truth of your love and your grace toward us. Make each one of us bold now as we approach your throne of grace, knowing there is nothing that we have to fear from you who know us best and love us most. Hear your people now.
15, verses 4 through 13. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfast, steadfastness and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Abba of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the God of truth, in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with God's people. And again, Praise the Most High, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise God. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God.
rise as you are able in body, mind, or spirit for a reading from the Holy Gospel. Hear the Holy Gospel according to our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to you, God. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. <laughs> For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus 
Each of the Gospels gives a slightly different nuance of Jesus, and in Jesus we have a personal relationship. So a definitive Jesus is hard to come by, because that Jesus is still living amongst us. But John the Baptist, nobody fussed about with him. He was allowed to be weird. <laughs> John the Baptist was permitted to remain socially embarrassing and peculiar. Um, and our society marginalizes uh, people like that. And they didn't always. Um, I have a picture on the right of a sadhu, a Hindu holy man. Um, and Hindu holy men are absolutely extraordinary. They will often live um, the lives of mendicants, which means that they wander with no possessions, and they beg for their living. And they gradually become more and more eccentric during the process, if they weren't eccentric to start off with. And some of them take on extraordinary austerities, um, and become really strange figures with great matted hair and covered in brightly colored paints. Some of them travel around the country completely naked, some of them have no possessions, even clothes. Um, and that's within the Hindu tradition, but in our own society, and the societies from which we came, there was once a place for these peculiar outsiders. It's said that before the Reformation, the old city walls of London were riddled with hermits, like woodworm in old furniture. That holy men and women were to be found secreted away within the foundations of the city. Mendicants, rather like the sadhus, used to wander Europe in the Middle Ages. In the town of Coventry a few years ago, in the Midlands of England, there was a, um, we call them just a homeless person, who had made their home on the side of a freeway uh, bypass in Coventry. And he was dirty and disheveled and unkempt. And he had massive great dreadlocks and matted hair all the way down to his waist. And he was an old Polish gentleman who had come to England to fight in the Second World War uh, as a uh, fighter pilot, like a lot of Poles did, um, to fight with the RAF. And he'd stayed and he'd gradually become more and more eccentric as the years had gone by. So he lived there in this weird ramshackle hut in the middle of nowhere. And all the English people thought he was a dirty vagrant. But the Sikhs and the Hindus believed him to be a holy man. And they brought tribute to him, and they gave him gifts. And they treated him like a special person. Because in his ravings, they believed that he had seen God, and that's why he had become unable to function in the society in which he lived. You see, John the Baptist was like a sadhu. John the Baptist was like a combination of a, a saint, a combination of the bag lady that's yelling at the street corner, a combination of the manic street preacher, a combination of all these things. And his clothing was camel hair. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Whereas his clothing was the same as the clothing of Elijah. So there's a, a reason why Matthew gave him this clothing. He's setting him in the same tone of the great prophets of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew world. But what is important is that his clothing and his food were gathered. He was dependent on society for nothing. He was pure. He was not beholden to anybody else for anything, which meant that in his solitude and in his place in the wilderness, he could speak the truth. He never had to cross his fingers behind his back. He never had to think, oh, well, I can't say that because then they won't do this and I won't get that and I won't. You know the web of complications in which we live. John the Baptist was not in that web. He had taken that two-edged sword of the truth of God and cut through the web and stepped through the gates into his wilderness. So John the Baptist is an extraordinary figure, a voice crying in the wilderness. And what is he saying? He's saying difficult things. He's always saying difficult things. That's the nature of these people. They're always inconvenient and worrying. They're never the sort of person you want to go out with dinner with. I mean, they're not the sort of person you'd want sharing your house. I mean, they're very, very strange. If you look at the collection of saints 
that uh, the church has historically said to be saints, they're really peculiar as well. I mean, there's one, as I think I've told you before, who grew a beard overnight because she didn't want to get married. Because she wanted to retain a virgin in the service of God. And being a virgin back then meant that you still got to make decisions about your own body. You weren't the possession of a man. So virginity was so important to those early Christian women because it meant that they could be wedded to God. They didn't have to be the chattel of a man. It was a way of standing up and saying, I am my own woman. When you grow a beard overnight, it's quite a feat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what does he say, moving swiftly on? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Well, these phrases are so loaded for us, we just think of some man with a placard on the corner of a street who is clearly mad. You know, they're generally in the category of mad people, people who say things like that. You know, we know how to deal with them. Uh, we ignore them, or we shuffle by in embarrassment, or we may throw a few coins into their hat if they have one. But we avoid them like the plague, you know, I mean, they're clearly mad. Well, what did it mean when John the Baptist said, is it the veil is thin? That's what John the Baptist is saying. The veil is thin. The veil between the kingdom and this earth is thin. The possibility is there for us to reach through that veil and grab the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God's will made present. Of God's presence is just across the veil. Therefore, we needed to repent. Repentance is another one of those words that we hate. We've had this conversation before in this church. Well, what is repentance? Repentance is, well, repentance is complex. I think of repentance in terms of John the Baptist saying to the people at that time, gold is going to be showered down from the heavens. Loads of gold will be coming. You need to clear out your storehouses from all that garbage you've collected in order to accommodate this gold. You are going to be showered with such riches you wouldn't believe it. And yet your storehouses are filled with clutter, garbage and filth. Now is the time to take that and throw it into the dumpster or send it to the thrift store. <laughs> Clear it out because riches are coming your way. So when he says repent, he is not talking about this process of self-hatred which we so often think of in terms of repentance. He is talking about a preparation. He is talking about making a straight way for the Lord. And the Lord in this case, of course, is Jesus Christ. And Christ is not a second name. It means the anointed. It means the heavenly king. It means the one anointed by God. It means the source and wellspring of our salvation. And it is this Jesus Christ, which is the gold, which will be showering down from heaven. And we need to empty our storehouses to accommodate this extraordinary gold. He then goes on to have a go at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, there's a pattern of this. In the Gospel of Matthew, there's quite a bit of bashing of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the big concern here is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees believe that by mere fact of birth, they have an entitlement to a salvation as the seed of Abraham. And this drives John the Baptist into a frothing fit. And from reading the Gospels, you get the impression that John the Baptist has quite a few frothing fits. <laughs> Nowadays, he'd be heavily medicated. <laughs> John the Baptist would never get to preach nowadays. You'd never hear his prophetic word because that man would be on mood stabilizers, he'd be on Xanax, he'd be on ADD medication, you name it. Because there is no place in our society for people who are peculiar and outspoken. Well, apart from pastors, of course. <laughs> Tell the truth, shame the devil, you know. I am peculiar and outspoken, always have been. But I wish. I had the bravery of John the Baptist, because yesterday I went back into my wilderness 
And I realized that the reason that John the Baptist had that wonderful truth is because he had gone to a place where he could not escape himself. The complications and the problems and the misery of our lives is so often because we will do anything we can to avoid having to be with ourselves. Anything we can. We entertain ourselves endlessly, sometimes in the most tedious ways. I mean, anyone who's sat through commercials on television has got to realize that there must be something going on which is dysfunctional to make you sit through a commercial for super mops. <laughs> yeah, I know you don't have them here, do you? Oh, yeah. oh God, blimey. I was thinking of Vileena super mops. They're like those, those, bis yeah, anyway. Yeah. Swiffer, that's the equivalent, yes, Swiffer. Next time you can go to the supermarket when you want to buy a Swiffer and you can say, can I have a Vileda Supermop, please? <laughs> and then they'll look at you like people look at me when I go shopping. <laughs> <coughs> like I'm barking. So he went to his wilderness primarily, well, we've already talked about the case whereby he was not dependent on society. He did not have to look to society in order to sustain him. Therefore, his lips were unsealed. His hands were untied. He didn't have to make the sort of compromises that we all make. We make a whole bunch of compromises for our comfort and our income and everything else. We've got to, allegedly. But we all do it. It's the decision we've all come to, to one degree or another. And it's the decision that's expected of us. But John didn't do it. Um, John went out into the wilderness and gain freedom, complete freedom. Now, he didn't gain freedom just because he was in the wilderness and away from people and not beholding on people. People came to him in large numbers. He gained freedom primarily because he went to that place where he couldn't escape from himself, where he had to face himself and learn to know who he was. The side effect of learning who you are is that you discover that in the same place that you are, God is. So when you search deep and discover who you are and make your peace with who you are, you find God is there as God is. Shorn from the fictions that we dress ourselves in. When we dress ourselves in fictions and vanities and lies, we also dress God in fictions and vanities and lies. Because the God who created us made us good enough. When we twist that that we have been created, we twist the image of God which is within us. So John, like the desert fathers and mothers who came after him, and like the prophets who went before him, who again were a peculiar bunch, prophets like Ezekiel, prophets like Jeremiah, cheerful man Jeremiah. <laughs> if you ever want a good belly laugh, read Lamentations. It's miserable. <laughs> the desert fathers and mothers had this saying. They believed that the monastic cells in which they lived, the little single room huts in which they lived, you made a covenant to them. You promised yourself to yourself. And you did that not as a form of extreme self-imprisonment, but you did that in the same way as you would promise yourself to your partner to your husband or wife. You do this so that there is time, so that there is patience, so that you can say to one another, I will not run away. I'm not going to run away. No matter what you are or who you are, I have made a promise to remain and we will grow together and learn together. Now, those monks and those nuns in the early years of the Christian era made a promise to their self that they would remain, that they would not run away from themselves. Because the temptation is always to say, it will be better somewhere else. It will be better if I go over there. It would be better if I had a cell over by the lake, if I had a cell in the middle of the desert. Always moving to somewhere more extreme. But that's a way of running away from self. So making a promise to self that you will not run away is like a marriage covenant. And that is what John the Baptist 
fundamentally did. He made a promise to himself. He, he made a covenant with the wilderness that there he would remain and discover what may be discovered. To discover God. And what he found was God. And what he found was a prophetic message. And also what he found was humility. Because when you discover who you are, you understand rightly who you are. Not the puffed up image that you might have, or even the debased image. If you have a lousy self-image, you discover exactly who you are. And that gives you, in front of God, humility. And of course, humility is this great, wonderful, anointing ointment of release and compassion and peace. People see humility as a lowering of our status and something undesirable, but of course, it's freedom, it's compassion. It's, you don't have to fight those battles anymore. You don't have to convince everybody that you're better than you are. You don't have to convince everybody that you have no appetites. You don't have to convince people that X is Y or white is black. You can say, yes, this is what it is. And in that humility is peace. John the Baptist did not claim for himself the anointing of God. <coughs> he was seen as this great prophet. People were coming thinking he was Elijah, thinking maybe he was the Messiah. They were coming from all over the place, giving him blessings and plaudits, probably offering him money. But he didn't say to them, yes, I am that prophet, I will lead you into the promised land. He said, I am merely preparing the way for another who will come much greater than me, somebody whose sandals I am not fit to tie. And he didn't say that with misery, he said it with joy. He said it with joy. So our humility is the wellspring of our draw joy, and our self-knowledge is the wellspring of our knowledge of God. The wilderness is a place that must be sought out. We must find some way of living in the wilderness while still continuing to function. Unless you are one of those people who is called, like the Sadhus, to go wandering. It's possible, you know. Even here, even now, it's possible. You can get a calling to the monastic life. You can get a calling to the solitary life. You can get a calling to the life of a preacher. You can get a calling to the life of a pastor. And don't start saying, well, I'm too old for that. Nonsense. Vocations come upon people at all times in their life, and they can be with them all their lives and be ignored. And then you can wonder why you have this abiding feeling of dissatisfaction. Because there might have been a vocation upon you for 20 or 30 years to which you didn't respond. So as we come to the end of this now, let us think of John the Baptist in a new light. Yes, he is a weirdo. <laughs> All right. Big time. Amen. He is a glorious, holy fool. He is a fool to the world. He is wise to God. And I guess we should all seek to be fools to the world. Because what we believe in is inherently foolish. Our faith is very foolish in human terms. And that's why it's been tampered about with so much over the centuries. It was dangerous even in the second century. They were starting to try and twist the faith so that it was more convenient to an emperor. But actually it's the faith of Jesus Christ and it's the faith of John the Baptist and it's our. And we should glory in it. Amen.
be seated. Our community prayer is often about those uh, in need and in security. Um, we announced a partnership with the Centre at the Nest Egg Food Bank. And I'd like to ask Ken Behrens to come forward and just to say a few words about what you can do with that. Well, now you're all wondering while I'm coming over here. Yeah. And I think I can talk almost as loud as this. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you can't just hold up your, your hand. We read something this morning, and it really hit me. May he defend the cause of the poor people and deliverance to the needy. Have you ever thought that he is us? It's us. We're the he. Now, I'm not going to say a lot, because I'm not 55, so um, they would not. <laughs> I'll see, I can do it, but I can't do this. We'll make a lot of paperwork if you fall But I'm going to stop by challenging you. We have three Sundays left. And when I walked in here and saw this, I said, I've got to challenge those people. So I went to Clayton and said, just let me see a few words, and I will. I'm going to challenge you. You've got three Sundays to do it. And you know you can go to the dollar store, my God, you can buy anything practically. This block right here, all the way around to this block right here. I'm going to challenge you when I come the Sunday, the third Sunday from now, I see this packed with food. We are the heat. We are the heat. Thank you very much. Amen. Oh, money God. There are many amongst our community, many perhaps here today, who live with food insecurity. Therefore, I pray for uh, an abiding generosity, not just a generosity of the moment, a generosity going through the months as we begin to partner with this organization, this organization that has been doing great work for years now, that has those professionals, those people who have devoted themselves to this work, and the volunteers, many of them from amongst our own people. We also pray for those who are sick, those who are not with us, those who are fighting against cancer and other illnesses. We especially, we lift up to you, our brother Harris, who's back in the Eisenhower Hospital. We pray for his partner Kent and all those who love him. We give you thanks and praise for all the Harris helpers who have been spending time with him over the last few weeks. We give you thanks and praise for our choir. We give you thanks and praise for our choir master and for the joy and for the praise and for the worship that they lift up in this place. We pray for Eric, Eric Buter. We pray for him because his partner Brian will be having a triple bypass surgery on Monday. The risks and the fear and the tremulation that go before that, we pray that he is surrounded by a, a circle of wisdom and expertise that that may go off uh, smoothly. We also pray for Joey, who is in the hospital. We pray for Eddie. Eddie's daughter is in the hospital. We pray that although Eddie's not with us this week, that our prayers may touch him and lift him up. We pray for Bill for David, for Jan. We pray for RD. We pray that Nancy may have the strength to comfort and support him, and that he may feel the love with which he is surrounded. And we give you thanks. We give you thanks and praise for deliverance. We give you thanks and praise for our brother Gene that he is not facing anything malignant and that he is soon to be restored to abundant health. 
Does anyone here have any concerns on their hearts? Please say amen. 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 Does anyone have any thanksgiving? Please say amen. 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 Almighty God, we offer these prayers in the name of God, who is Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please rise as you are able and sing the Lord's Prayer.
the moderator circle to support the fellowship. So please come forward and give that act of faith to our church and pray and think over the next week, not just about our church, but about the moderator circle as an over and above statement of solidarity with all your fellow MCCers in this country and in other countries. Please come forward.
made a sin of the world, happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Here at MCC, we practice an open communion, uh, which means to our newcomers or those who haven't been for a while, you don't have to be a member of this particular church or any other church or denomination in order to come forward for communion. Uh, you just have to be willing in your heart. The meal is freely given uh, and you are most welcome. If you'd rather receive a blessing, then come up like this and we'll give you a blessing. Um, and there will be prayer partners on either side of the church uh, ready to pray with you and give you the oil of anointing if you so require. So please, come forward. The meal is ready.
Thanksgiving, we give thanks today for David McGee, who has been standing in for the breach at this first Sunday at Jordan. Thank you very much. And now, Almighty God, we give you thanks for all you have given us in sacrament, in word, in prayer, and in anointing. And as we go forth from this place, let us find our wilderness and find ourselves, and in that self, let us find you. In the glory of our created being, let us find the glory of God Almighty. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.